Um, David uh, taught for many years at uh, New Jersey's Chicago, uh, Stockton State uh, College. He uh, has a PhD in philosophy from the University of Toronto. Uh, he is one of the uh, you know, key figures and one of the five founders of SGML Open, now known as OASIS. Uh, he's done an incredible amount of work, and uh, John Palfrey showed you the ter terrific book that he's published, and he now will tell you where do we go from here. Welcome, Dave Weinberger. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, no, nothing like having a challenge presented that I can't possibly live up to. On the other hand, I am struck, Lewis, by the Dolphin Seafood Cafe. Is there a worse name for a restaurant? <laughs> the, the sentient mammal roast place. It's, uh, so I, I will be, I, I hope, brief, um, relatively anyway. Um, and I, I, I do, I want to talk about the opportunity that change in knowledge, change in technology is bringing, uh, bringing to us, um, enabling us, it's bringing about a change in, Here, if I get any calls, feel free to just answer them. Thank you. <laughs> I've been disarmed now. <laughs> right, an angry dolphin calling. Um, so there, there's obviously a change in knowledge happening. It's obviously connected to the technology. Um, the thing that's confusing about it, uh, one of the things that's confusing about it, is that the change, I think, that what we're changing to is in fact what we've always believed all along, but we've had this idea of knowledge that's completely out of whack with how it actually works. For example, PhDs. Thank you, Richard, for bringing that up. Um, I, I am, first, I, I am, uh, I'm privileged to be at the Berkman Center. This is an amazing group of people. And I think, I, I now mentally go down sort of the table during one of the discussions, and I try to think, who has a PhD? I don't have the slightest idea. I don't know, and it's, it's irrelevant. I do know that some of the, I, I do know that some of the people there who are absolutely the brightest and the best contributors, but no, no PhD. So it, it has never mattered. It's actually never really mattered. But we've had this idea that it, it does, that, it, that authorities have authority. Well, you know, they never did. That was never enough. But, um, and in the same way, we have an idea of knowledge that I think is out of touch with how knowledge has always been. And the real change that's happening is that now the knowledge that we're developing matches what we've always known knowledge is, which is one of the reasons why we can move so quickly and easily into this truly bizarre world that, that we're building for, for one another. The, the web, the internet, is just a, it's, you can look at almost any piece of it and it defies expectations of socially in, in, in every way, and yet a billion people, only a billion people, but a billion people have jumped into this complex, difficult, weird technology and have understood it without training. You know, you did, nobody got trained in how to use a web browser. You, know, you taught your kid how to ride a bicycle, you didn't teach her how to use the web browser. So apparently there's something familiar about it. So really quickly, I mean, we have, the, the, we, we have a long history in the West of what, of what knowledge means. It has a couple of uh, salient characteristics, properties. Um, for example, we have assumed, we have thought, we have believed deeply that knowledge is a mental state, that it's, it's classically, it's, it's justified true belief, but it's belief. It's the belief worth believing, and belief is a mental state, and it's somehow in, supposed to be in correspondence with the external world. Um, we've assumed that there is one knowledge. We don't have a plural for the term. There's one knowledge, and it's the same for everyone. It's just the way it is. And, by, and it's binary. I know the online world, the digital world, is supposed to be binary. It's really the real world that, in, in many ways, is significantly binary, and especially knowledge, where if something is true, everything else that contradicts it is false. There's only one. It's either true or it's false, and if it's true, that's that. Um, it's it's uh, simple in the sense that it's simpler than the complex than the complexities of the world um, seem. Simpler than how complex the world seems. We find the underlying patterns that make sense of the seeming chaos of the world. So knowledge in that sense is simple. I mean, clearly it's not you know a piece of cake, but it's simpler than than the chaos that we see. And and we thought that knowledge is this multi generational realm. It's a realm, and, and if you're lucky, if you have a PhD and you get a publisher, and of course getting a publisher was a hard thing because there were economics involved and only so much paper in the world, so you get a publisher and maybe, maybe you'll get your book shelved in the hall of knowledge. And then from that, you've, and you've added your little bit. 
to the, this transgenerational realm of knowledge that we build up over time, gets richer and richer. It's independent of any of us, it's curated, uh, and if we're lucky, we get to add to it. So uh, this is the picture that generally we've had of knowledge, and it's, it turns out that the first indication that maybe, maybe there's something not quite right about this picture is that those qualities almost all are also properties of the real. It would be a shame if it turned out that our notion of what, if we limited knowledge by the same constraints that are on the real. You know, real things are binary. They gotta go in one place and not a, another. Um, there's only one real world, and it's the same for all of us. Well, it, tur it turns out that the properties of knowledge and the property of, the, of reality, the properties of reality are basically the same, and the linchpin for this is that we've been required the best we could do to store and communicate knowledge is to use physical objects, and, and books are the paradigm of this. And we all love books, nevertheless, we also know how limited books are, how it, hard it is, not only to get published, so there's a natural uh, limitation there, but how hard it is to follow an idea from one book to another. And if you've gone up the elevator at the Widener in order to go down the elevator to get to the tunnel at the Widener, you know what I mean. You know, books are, are wonderful, but they have real limitation when it comes to uh, to connecting knowledge, and they give the sense that knowledge is something finished. So we've broken the back of reality now. We're moving all this online, and so those constraints don't hold. And we're suddenly liberated, and we don't know quite what to do, but that's okay. We're, this is a really, really early in, in the process. We don't even have good tools for reading long things online. I mean, that, we'll look back at these days as, as primitive beginnings. We can't even read online except in small chunks. But we already see stuff that's happening. So, for example, it seems really clear to me that, not, and I think you won't have a problem with this, that knowledge, oh, at Doc Searles, you will, if you hear one more thing where it's blank is a conversation, will you either throw up or sue? <laughs> uh, because knowledge is, in fact, conversational, in any case. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and it's not just markets. Um, it's, it, well, it's a lot of things because conversation is how we talk with one another and discover the world and point out, turn ourselves to the world in the same way. So it's the most fundamental thing that we do as humans. It's also the most fundamental knowledge process that we have. Oh, look at that. That's the beginning of conversation. That's the beginning of knowledge. It's a social thing. Um, so, I mean, I could go to Wikipedia, but every, nothing personal yesterday. Everybody's tired of Wikipedia as an example uh, of conversational knowledge, so I won't. We're not tired of Wikipedia, just tired of it as an example. So uh, instead, a, a, a humbler example, uh, we're all on mailing lists. I would venture that most of us have been on mailing lists for many, many years, and that for many or even for most of us, mailing lists are a primary way that we learn about the world and, and get knowledge. So I'm on a, for whatever reason, I'm on a mailing list about the FCC, a topic I know very little about. I am so far from being an expert in this, but I care about, because I care about internet stuff, in a particular way, so I'm on this mailing list for many years, there are people who are on it who I know by name, I have no idea who they are. I don't know, it's a, it's in some cases they use their real name, but it might as well be a pseudonym, because I don't know, that's all I know. I don't know if they have a PhD, I don't know if they work for the FC, I don't know, but I do know at this point, after five or six years of being on this mailing list, who I can immediately believe, who, if I, one comes in from, from Harold, I know I'm gonna read that one, because Harold is amazing. Harold knows everything about the FCC, and he can explain it. Though it's not just that Harold does this. By the way, it's Harold Feld. I might as well give him his name, um, which I believe is not a pseudonym. Uh, I also know that Harold is not going to go unchallenged, that there are other people who disagree with him who will say, you know, Harold, I think you got this wrong, or this, you didn't consider this. You know, it's the sort of thing that happens on a mailing list. It happens in human conversation. And so, and so Harold, the expert, a deep, real expert. I have no idea what his credentials are. Don't care. Harold the expert is made smarter by being on the list. In fact, the real point is that the knowledge that I get from this list is the list itself. It is not Harold. It is not the person who disputes with Harold this time or the other person who, you know, there are other people besides Harold on this list, by the way. The knowledge is in the list. The knowledge is smarter than any of the people on the list, just as Wikipedia is smarter than any of the people who contribute to Wikipedia when it works well, which is most of the time. This is nothing startling about this. It was true of every class that wasn't simply a lecture class. 
It's always the case. Every conversation you have, we've always known that knowledge is better in conversation. It's better between us than it is when it's in our heads. In fact, we now have, if we, and it's just depressing that we ever needed proof that knowledge is not mental content, but now we have it. Every time you read a mailing list, you know the knowledge is in the conversation. It is not in Harold's head. It's not in your head. It's not in any head. It's in us talking together, and that's what we can do now. So we find this out on the web. We always knew this. We always, so what the web is revealing to us about knowledge is what we've always known about knowledge, but our, our thinking about it has, has disputed. We're also learning, I think, uh, that, um, or, that the knowledge that we're developing is potential. It's more important as potential. It's more important that you get your post up on your blog because then it's out there, getting it out there. Well, that, what, what does it mean to get stuff out there? It means making it available so other people can get it right or make sense of it or mash it up or dispute it. And so now knowledge emerges. But first, you have to get it out there. And to get the stuff connected, it's not enough that it be out there. It's got to be linked. And so sometimes you, you try to get other people to link to it, because in part because we're humans and we like, to, we like the attention. But you also, if it's not linked, if it's just sitting there, nothing links to it. It's literally not on the web. You've got to get it linked one way or another. We need those attachments. And the knowledge is the potential in those attachments. It's in, the, it's in those links. It's, so we end up now with, um, with nuance. Well, we've always had nuance. Of course we, we have. We're a very clever, subtle species, and we've relied upon it. But now we, we have, we've had this idea that there are authorities who have PhDs. I'm sorry, I'm stuck on that, and it's Richard's fault, um, who are authorities. Well, you know, that never worked. It doesn't work now. Instead, what we have, are, as we always have, are nuances of, of authority, where authority becomes metadata. Authority is, here's, a, here's metadata that tells me I should believe you, to one degree or another. And we all get to create the metadata, which is a huge problem, of course, because a lot of us aren't qualified to judge what should be believed. But we do anyway, because just as we continue to talk, even though we're not qualified to. And of course we do. So we have this issue, because everybody now can use metadata to point at stuff and say, believe this, don't believe this. This is sort of right. Got the first part of this right. Liked the first chapter. Hated chapter four. Uh, read the first nine pages. It's crap. Whatever. We all get to do that. Knowledge, the authority of knowledge gets split off from the thing itself. It becomes metadata pointing at it, metadata we can all create. This is really hard to, this doesn't fit well into the model of credentialing uh, institutions, but it's already there. And I should mention, by the way, that one of the really good things about this is that now everything is becoming metadata. So, uh, I mean, literally, everything online is metadata. Um, we still need to do the thing that we've done in the real world, which is to take big pieces of information, reduce them to small physical objects, and then arrange the small physical objects so we can go back to the big pieces, whether it's a list or it's a card catalog or the electronic, electronic representation of a card catalog. Our basic technique has been to reduce the amount of data from the original, separate it, use this tiny little bit, which we think through really carefully. We have library science and we have other sciences that help us figure out what is the best shrunken version of this information object to have. And we needed that because if you made the, the card catalog as big as the book, you don't have a card catalog, you have a, a, a second library. And in fact, you want more information than what's in the book because you want to know everything about the book. That's, it. That's metadata also. It's the biography of the author is metadata about the book and the history of the country. And you know, well, now we have that. The content, you can, you can search using the content to find the author as well as looking up the author as metadata to find the content. Everything is metadata. And since metadata is what we use, what we know, and we use to find what we don't know, that means our species has gotten radically s smarter. But it's not easy, especially for institutions that have become expert and authorities at shrunken metadata. So let me be clear. We still need the shrunken metadata. There's lots of places where it's crucial. And it's very hard to do that right. But at the same time, the metadata doors have blown open. There is, in fact, no formal distinction between metadata and data. Metadata is what you have, what you know, and data is what you're looking for. So. You, Authority becomes separable, becomes metadata. It, it, it's open. It's one of one of the perils of open access is that the met, the metadata that indicates authority is now out of control. 
but we're a clever species. And so we are good at judging. We're really actually quite good at judging who to believe based upon usually often implicit metadata. Does this person sound like a jerk, for example? Uh, and we're really clever at coming up with solutions to problems when we need to, when we really need to know who to believe because landing the plane or replacing the heart depends upon it, then we come up with systems to do that. And this is one of the big challenges and, and huge opportunities that we have in front of us. In fact, that's, that's, you know, Kareem started off by saying that this is a challenge. And absolutely, we are, the, the knowledge beyond authority is a huge challenge, but of course, and as I'm sure everybody here agrees, it's a huge opportunity. It is a huge opportunity. Um, it, it, the walls are down, the walls are down. That's part of the meaning of talking about the university, as if there were one. Well, you strip it down to fighting weight, and there is one university that shares a set of goals. It shares a set of values. Everybody in this room knows what they are. Everybody in this room is committed to them. Many of us are, have been committed to them for our lifetimes and have sacrificed to support those values. Which is why it's important not to be too realistic, at least not yet. Realism's really important, and it's, it's crucial to have adults who are capable of engaging in in realistic and compro uh, doing compromises and, and trying to find common ground. I, I don't feel like that needs a defense, so I'm not going to. But I, I want to defend not being realistic for just a second. We are at this, this, cr this cr crucial, well, I'm about to uh, repeat myself, crucial crossroads. We're at a crossroads, you know. And I, I'm actually, so Charlie Nesson, who is, I am sure, right now recovering? Do we have any news or report on Charlie? He's recovering, he's gonna be fine. So I, I'm, I, I'm officially, an, I'm an optimist about the web. I sometimes get beaten up for being too, too optimistic. Uh, you know, I ought to talk more about the bad things, but I figure there's lots of people doing that. I don't really need to talk about the bad things in the web. So I'm officially an optimist about the web, but if you know me personally at all, you know I've been deeply, I, I've been close to clinically depressed about the politics of the web about what's happening to the web, the threat to the web, that I am still actually fairly depressed about. Um, about a year ago, Charlie snapped me out of a big chunk of it. Charlie said that I was complaining again. I was just bemoaning, you know, they're gonna win. They're gonna shut the thing down. It's gonna become TV. And Charlie said, you know, he shares many of those concerns, of course, but, um, there's always the university. And the university is the bastion of openness. It's committed to openness. It's about open access to knowledge. It's about freedom. That's what it's about. And the internet is completely congruent with, congruent with that. The internet is the instrument of, ex of blowing open the doors, blowing down the walls. It, that is, that's why we care about it so much. And so Charlie said, you know, there is this one institution that's powerful, that's well established, that actually even has some money, has a great deal of respect, has a great deal of authority, touches the youth, is listened to to some degree by those in power, and it's the university. And that's something we can do, and we can. I had not just a moment of hope, I have a continuing thread of hope that, that we, that we can preserve these values that we can, without, and it won't work if we get too realistic, because then we'll compromise. But there's no compromising on our core values. We don't have to, it's way too early to compromise on this stuff. It's way too early to be realistic. Because what we choose is reality here at this point, I'm sorry, I you would never ever say reality is what we dream it to be. But there are moments in history when it is, and this is one of them. So we need not to be, we need realism. We don't need too much realism. We have a chance now to take the openness that we have, we've lived in and fought for and to blow it open historically. And so I don't, want, I don't want in 50 years or 500 years of the history books to say, and at this moment in time, they faced a choice between, between a new renaissance and new dark ages, and they took the new dark ages. But that's our choice now. And I'm actually feeling pretty confident that not, not only are we going to seize it, but it's going to be the, the university that's going to lead the way. So thank you. Thank you, Charlie. And I hope he's doing well.